I am incredibly excited uh, to welcome uh, General Stanley McChrystal today um, to our speaker series. So General McChrystal was uh, retired in 2010 as a four-star general. Um, at that time was the leader of all of America and allied forces in Afghanistan. He had, through the course of his career, led some of America's most elite military units, including the Joint Special Operations Command, um, which oversees uh, America's elite counterterrorism units um, during what was an incredibly tumultuous time in Iraq, which he describes in his book, Team of Teams, and the process of learning and adapting to a new type of warfare, to dealing with the counterinsurgency of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and ultimately tracking down and killing Abu Musab al-Zakari, who had a tremendous amount of American and, and frankly, Iraqi blood on his hands. And, you know, that transformation and how it was architected is something that I um, want to discuss He's also the author of three other New York Times bestselling books in addition to Team of Teams, um, including his memoir, My Share of the Task. Uh, and he is a passionate uh, advocate for national service, which is uh, something all of you know uh, Jen and I care about very deeply. Um, he's been a fellow at Yale's Jackson Institute. He is the founder um, and head of the McChrystal Group, a consultancy on global leadership um, and an individual who has dedicated his life to service uh, to our country. So uh, thank you for being here. You're kind, it's uh, an honor. Yeah, well, very excited to have you. So why don't we start, so much to discuss, um, but why don't we start at the beginning? Um, because uh, you grew up um, on an army base. Uh, you were the son and grandson of soldiers. Um, was there ever a time you thought of a different path uh, in life? I got asked that question yeah. once by a ninth grader. Did I ever think about <laughs> any school but West Point? And I said, no. And she goes, that doesn't seem very smart. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're right. I was son yeah. and grandson of Army officers, and I wanted to be my father. And I have four brothers, and they all went in the mm -hmm. Army, and my sister married a soldier. And then when I met my wife. I was a cadet at West Point and she was the daughter of a career army officer. Her mm -hmm. three brothers were soldiers. Yeah. Her sister's the widow of a guy. So, I mean, it was that way. So I didn't think about it. It was just automatic. And I was fortunate that when I got in and I loved it. Yeah. But I just thought that if I could be as much like my dad as possible, then I still feel that way. He's passed now, but I still feel. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's incredible. But you know, what's interesting is, is you got to West Point and, um, you know, notwithstanding uh, the fact that you had um, a, a truly storied career in the military, um, you kind of had a rough start at the beginning. Um, you describe in your, your memoir that you were a, a century man. What, I mean, maybe explain what, yeah. what that means um, and, and uh, you know, and kind of how you yeah. navigated through that. You know, it's funny about that because my father went to West Point during yeah. World War II. And so I wanted to go to West Point because if you want to be a soldier, that seemed like the right thing to do. But I didn't think of West Point as a destination. I think of West Point as just a point mm -hmm. you pass through to go be a, an army officer. And so I got there in 1972. And if you're impressed that I got in, stop. <laughs> 1972 is the easiest year in the Academy's entire history, statistically, <laughs> to be levied because the <laughs> military wasn't very popular right after Vietnam. So I entered in 1972 as a 17-year-old. That is the 170th anniversary of West Point. So they're 170 years old. I'm 17. They've got 170 years of taking themselves pretty seriously. I got 17 years and I don't. And we have this clash. <laughs> and I get up there and I didn't want to study. And I had discipline problems. Mm -hmm. the, the way you get in trouble, when you get in trouble at West Point, you get what they call a slug. And that's a punishment. So I got one in the first summer, which never happens. So I entered the year like a convict being delivered to my first company. And then I got three more in the next 18 months. And in fact, the last one, I, me and three friends went to the West Point Museum and you could check out real weapons, not ammunition, but you could check them out to, to learn about them, take them to your rooms. Yeah. So we got the idea that one night we should take these real weapons and attack the place where seniors took their mm -hmm. dates on Thursday nights. And so we did. <laughs> and we went in going bang, 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 and yeah. throwing rolled up socks as hand grenades. <laughs> and 
the MPs reacted. I mean, they thought yeah. it was a real terrorist attack. <laughs> and so I was going to get thrown out if the officer in charge wrote the offense up a certain way, because I'd be over demerits. And for some reason, this captain who I've never seen since, he wrote with the wording that would keep me just under the number of demerits. That's amazing. And so for the first two years, I was at the bottom of class academically, bottom of the class disciplinary wise, you know, bottom of life. Mm -hmm. And then two things happened, kind of amazingly. I met this girl who has been my wife for 47 years now, and she sort of helped straighten me out. And then I got a new tactical officer. So in the, the first week of my junior year, I show up to West Point. Every cadet has a a one-on-one -on -one with the new tactical officer. We mm -hmm. sit down kind of like Dave and I are, are now. And he takes his file and he goes, I think you're going to be a great soldier. And I think you're really going to have a good future. And I'm like, <laughs> you got the right file? <laughs> and, he goes, and he goes, yeah. And I said, well, <laughs> how's that? And he goes, the things you're good at are going to translate well in the Army. They don't translate well here at West Point. Mm. Don't worry about it. And interestingly, you know, he became a, a great friend and mentor for the rest of my life, uh, or has been, um, because he just said, I believe in you. Mm -hmm. Maybe that was the point in my cadet period when I had least belief in myself as a soldier or anything else. And so it was, um, it was a pretty amazing case of leadership on a guy almost the first time I'd met him. Yeah. How did... I mean, it, it is amazing, and it, it you know it's those moments of grace every now and then in our. I think we all have in our lives where, you know, things could have gone one way or things yeah. could have gone another, and and someone intervened. I mean, how, as as you look back on that, and then grew as a leader yourself. I mean, how how did you think about that? I mean, we you know from the outside, I think we we always think about the military as as I mean you know people almost want to finish the 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 phrase military discipline right and right. and. You know, how did you think, how do you think as you evolved as a leader about, about, you know, forgiveness and grace and letting people make mistakes? Yeah, I, and I don't think the military does this very well because in many ways the military has a one strike and you're out policy. If you're mm -hmm. a, a, a rising senior leader and you have a mistake on your record, you likely won't be selected for promotion or command at the next level. And I think that's unfortunate because most of us learn the most from big mistakes we mm -hmm. make. So I've been blessed with being given grace a number of times. And during my career, I, I really found it good. If somebody was trying hard, if they weren't dishonest, mm -hmm. even if they made a really stupid call, you know, we all have those judgment times. There's almost nothing quite so powerful as someone who has seen the abyss and come back and say, you know, I almost screwed my whole life up. Yeah. And, and so I'm a great believer that in many cases you can build bonds of loyalty around that moment you look and say everybody okay just mm -hmm. don't do it again what do yeah. we learn and i think that organizations we we have this sometimes this tendency to want to put all things in numbers and say well this person mm -hmm. you know has a black mark of things so that's a reason not to promote them or not to push them i think that's a mistake mm -hmm. um the whole idea of entrepreneurship in the united states is based on failure yeah and you learn from that. And so I think yeah, that we were talking about that yeah, before that was, every uh, organization yeah. should think a bit about that. Yeah. I also think if you think about leadership, what incredible power and responsibility you're given when you have the ability to provide forgiveness or grace or a second chance. That's not, I mean, if, if it's just a checklist, they don't need you. Mm -hmm. A machine can do that. They need us. If you're sitting across the table using judgment and says, you know, I believe in you. I'm willing to take a chance on you. Yeah, yeah. So take us through. I want to get to, you know, that moment in Iraq where you're running Chase sure. Sock, but, but, but obviously there was uh, some distance from, from getting from West Point to um, being the leader who, who was ready for that moment. So, you know, take us through just some of, sure. as you think about it, the highlights and the, the things that really made a difference to you as you evolved uh, through the course of your career. I know this... Sure, and I'll take you real quickly. You, yeah. you stair-step your way in the military at different ranks, different levels of command, more people. When I was a lieutenant and then a captain, probably the first 10 years of my career, I was a classic micromanager. 
I mean, I was, if any of you were micromanagers, I think I could trump you. <laughs> I, I put all my armored vehicles, had 14 of them as a captain, on the same radio frequency. So if I said turn left, everything turn left at the same time. <laughs> that is a real sense of power. Um, it's not the best way to fight them, though. So I, I was really good at that, and that worked at a small mm-hmm. level. And then when you get to a certain level where your people are more mature and there's more judgment, it's a more complex, complex environment, you have to learn to let go. So about the time I was a senior captain, mm-hmm. I ran into a bunch of very good sergeants in a ranger company I led who just wouldn't put up with it. I said, we don't need you leading like that. Mm. If you're going to lead like that, you don't need us. And so they kind of pushed back and they were right. And so I started this journey that changed the way I thought about leadership, really started about 10 years in. And then by the time I was a battalion commander, you got about 600 people. And it's a great level because you know everybody. Mm -hmm. You've been in the Army long enough to know your business pretty well. Um, I began to understand that really the the way to make this thing work was through your leaders. Mm -hmm. So focus on developing leaders. I also started to learn something that I'd heard it said when I was younger. It says, if it's stupid and it works, it ain't stupid. And you sit back and you go, hmm, that's silly. But no, it's actually not. But in many businesses, and the, the Army has what we call doctrine. That mm-hmm. tells you how to do stuff, how you should fight. And unfortunately, it's a crutch for people. It's designed to be general guidance on mm-hmm. how to conduct operations. But a lot of people use it as a recipe. And so they get doctrine and they use the doctrinal requirement in every situation, even though every situation is unique. So it's why the U.S. military always struggles in war, because we go from the last war, we've created these great recipes that won the last part of the last war, and we try to apply them. And then it takes us a year or two to figure out and start to change. It's a very painful requirement. And I started to learn that doctrine is only very loose, and the only thing that matters is winning, succeeding. Not personally, but the organization getting the mission done. And so I started to become much more... You know, people called me a kind of classic. I didn't think I was Mm -hmm. formerly that. But I started thinking, okay, whatever we got to do to be successful. And therefore, we got to be willing to to change. Yeah. And and that, I mean, I think that's a good segue because you had this moment, you found yourself now very senior leader in in charge of the Joint Special Operations Command. Um, So leading the elite of the elite. Um, But you were in Iraq. And, um, you know, the best soldiers in the best military in the world who are well-equipped, well-armed, um, have all the resources that America can provide, and you're struggling to keep up with al-Qaeda in Iraq and this counterinsurgency. So, you know, what, what were you facing? I mean, I guess start with what were you facing at that sure. moment, and how was it, what were the things that weren't working? Yeah, and I'll... I'll in two different directions, because you're right, in the fall of 2003, I took command of this Joint Special Operations Command. Real quick history, it was formed after the failure of the Iran rescue mission in the spring of 1980. So the U.S. decided we've got to have a great counterterrorist force. Some other nations had that already. Israel was ahead of us. The British had 2-2-SAS. The military, U.S. didn't have that. So we created that. And we created Delta Force and SEAL Team 6 and these very specialized units, counter hostage, uh, rescue, things like that. And we put them all in this special. Those specialized units were created to the SEALs existed, but those specialized units were created after after this. Delta was created right before it. But JSOC was created to bring them together. Interesting. Okay, But most of the others were created after. Interesting. And so we created this command, JSOC, to lead them. And it was the super secret one. And the, it was, we all wore civilian clothes and opening sunglasses <laughs> hanging around your neck because we didn't know, want people to know who we were. Now, we were stationed on Fort Bragg, so we're the only people walking around in civilian clothes. And, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> we weren't just secret, we were cool. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, you can't, because cool breeds arrogance. Mm-hmm. Arrogance breeds an unwillingness to change. So we founded formally in 1981, and for the first 22 years, it was great. And I grew up in it. And so I grew up at various levels and whatnot. And then Grenada, Panama, first Gulf War, we did all these neat things, and we're getting better and better. We got every resource we ever wanted. Mm -hmm. 
Then in 2003, after about two years into the war on terror, we'd done parts of the first part in Afghanistan, parts of the invasion of Iraq. But in the fall of 2003, the whole Iraq project, we'll call it, was going down the tubes. The Iraqis were resisting it. Mm -hmm. There was general resistance to the West occupiers, they called us. And inside that, there was this terrorist group, not the whole insurgency, but this very cancerous-like thing called al-Qaeda in Iraq. And it was the existential threat. It was the thing that was going to kill the whole effort. And so you have this moment when it's going down and the U.S. doesn't seem to know which way is up. And we tried to declare mission accomplished and all that wasn't true. I get made commander of JSOC. Mm -hmm. Now, I've got this counter-terrorist force, the best in the world by now, literally, bar none. And it's been unbroken, mostly unbroken successes. And I made the commander and I'm told to go after that Al-Qaeda in Iraq. So I take over thinking, okay, what I'm going to do is be better than my predecessor. I'm going to play the same plays mm -hmm. we did, just shine it up a little bit, just yeah. be a little better. And that's all we'll do because I've already got the best counter-terrorist force in the world. And we go against Al-Qaeda in Iraq and we start doing all the things we're good at. And we're not only doing them, we're doing them better than we've ever done it before. We're performing extraordinarily. And yet the outcome's different. We're not beating them. We're not only not beating them, they're beating us. And that is just disorienting as can be. And so I lean into the command harder. I literally push him and I say, okay, we got to work harder, work harder, boom, 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 push. Uh, and it was, a, it was a bloody grim effort, and but we're still just falling further behind. And then we come to the realization that the problem had changed. So the problem that was Al-Qaeda in Iraq, they weren't like other terrorist groups. They were this information technology enabled thing that organically had become this network. They weren't like a great white shark that's gonna come eat you. They were like a school of piranha. You could kill a hundred of them, didn't matter because the rest loosely coordinated would come and bite you to death. And so we're trying to deal with that. And I realize, and we're studying them and we're doing all these things that I come to the conclusion, the problem ain't them, it's us. And the problem is that we're so good at what we do, and we're so confident at what we do, and we're so used to what we do that we keep doing what we do. And so we had to change. And to, to step back a little bit, we had a group of units. We had Delta Force, the Army Commando Unit. I'd say the best in the world. SEAL Team 6, that the navies you've heard all about them, uh, counter-terrorists. If you think about people, don't think 22-year-old soldier. Think 35-year-old man or woman with a family, kids in high school, been in the military, combat veteran, you know, real pros. Um, and then we've got these other organizations, all with distinct cultures, but they're all very cohesive, very proud, very elite, and they're tribal. There's a quote that I put in the book from a Navy SEAL. It says, there's a point at which everyone else sucks. Hmm. Now, only a Navy SEAL could have that eloquence, but the reality is, <laughs> What he's saying is, I've got this five-man assault team I've been on for six years with, without a person changing. My platoon of 20 has been almost the same all that whole period. Everybody <laughs> beyond that is not my family. They may be in the U.S. military, but they're not somebody I trust and all. And so this tribal nature made us unwilling to work as a team. Everybody wanted just to be told what to do, just stay out of my way. I'll put the roof on, don't worry about any of the other stuff. But you couldn't win the war that way. You had to have a synergy across the organizations. So we had this interesting challenge that may sound familiar to you. We had to leverage the specific strengths, morale, cohesion, talents of each of those individual cultures. We couldn't weaken those because we needed that skill. On the other hand, we had to achieve a synergy where there had never been synergy before. We had to work together in ways that we were able to tease out effectiveness, not just efficiency, because we were fighting across 27 countries at the same time. Iraq, we had 17 task forces fighting the hardest part of the fight, but we're in the Horn of Africa, we're in Pakistan, we're doing operations, and they're all connected because the mm -hmm. enemy's all connected. And so we have got to create the right level of synergy, maintaining the right level of effectiveness and pride at those things, and it's I used to describe it to people, it's like harnessing nuclear power. You're bringing together things. If you get it wrong, it'll melt down or it'll blow up. 
But if you get it right, it produces this extraordinary amount of energy mm-hmm. and nothing else would get the job done. And so my journey, my personal journey as a leader of this thing, and then our journey as an organization was, how do you take an organization like this and make that transformation in combat and, and fight the war and make it work? And I, I signed up for command. You know, all commands are two years in the Army. So I take command in the fall of 2003, going to do two years. And I tell my wife, okay, I got to go and I'm staying. So I go and about halfway through the first year, you know, I told my boss and I told my wife, I got to stay a third year. So I'm going to ask him because we're not done. This isn't near done. So I asked for a third year and they said, yeah, okay. And then the next year I called my wife and I said, this thing's still grim. I'm going to volunteer for fourth year. And she says, do what you got to do, then come home. And the midway through the fifth year, I didn't call her, or mid- midway through the fourth year before the fifth year, I didn't call her, but she went to the Pentagon for a ceremony for a friend of mine, and somebody came up to her and said, hey, Annie, your good news, Stan's extension for a fifth year has been approved. <laughs> Lesson <laughs> learned, make the call. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, I stayed for five years because that kind of transformation takes that kind of commitment for an organization and the leader. And so my main goal during that whole time, I became much less focused on what we were doing operationally, which was where my expertise and experience was and comfort level. And my contribution to the organization was making the pieces fit together, which was because you had to get the CIA, the National Security Agency, the FBI, I mean, all challenges in themselves to get them to build a community that became the major focus of my effort. And it also turned about to be the major leverage that we could go to be significantly more effective, which right. we became. And how, so what were the key assets? You have a great phrase that I love about the difference between, um, you know, doing, um, uh, you know, things right and doing the right thing, right? Yeah. Um, and, but how did you begin to t- tell us a little bit about that concept, but, but also, you know, yeah. what were the aspects of sort of the transformation sure. of getting, getting all these disparate groups, right? The, the pride of the seals, the pride of the, yeah. you know, Delta and the CIA. And how, how did you begin to get everybody to kind of work together? What were, you know, as a, as a practical matter, you know, from 2003 to 2004, what yeah. were the things that started it's to kind change? of a practical journey as yeah. we could call it, because you, you get this idea, you want everybody to work together. So you bring them together. Yeah. Kumbaya, we're going to work together. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And that, of course, was special you can't just, You can't just tell everybody to work together, right? No. It doesn't like, you can't send that memo. And all special operators, we try, we try. they got the right answer. <laughs> they sit in the back and they just go, you know, General Stan, we love you, but you lost it, man. And so I had to do practical things. I had to shake up the status quo. So one of the first things was how we communicated. We had six levels in the chain of command from where I was in Iraq down to the people on the ground actually pulling triggers. And in the military, the chain of command is sacrosanct. You have a boss, your boss has a boss, hit boss, hit boss, hit boss, center. Information flows that way, orders flow that way, information, intelligence flows back up that way. And in a slow moving environment, it's fine because it's controlled, it's predictable, it's accountable. In a fast moving environment, it's slow and that's, will work. And so we started when I took over with this morning meeting at my level and about nine o'clock in the morning and we were video teleconferencing across these 27 countries to include back to the United States. And then the idea was an hour later, the next level would have their meeting and pass information. But that's like telephone. By the time it gets down, one, it's late to need, the information's corrupted unintentionally and you know they don't have time to deal with it. And so it just doesn't work. And so on the one hand, we've got this sacrosanct respect for the chain of command and two, it doesn't work. And so we just said, okay, we're going to go to one meeting. So we put the entire organization on a daily call. And instead of 30 minutes with 50 people, which we started with, we went to 90 minutes with 7,500 people on a secure video teleconference. Now that sounds like madness, right? You're all going, ah, (laughs) the mother of all meetings. But the reality was the most efficient thing we've ever had because the entire organization got aligned on what the situation is, what we're trying to do, heard the senior leaders talking about it, could talk. We'd reach down to young people. It was controlled because you can't have 7,500 people having a conversation without control. 
but it was very focused and it kept cranking right along and hit the important things. Everybody walked out of that and it ended about 5.30 in the evening, Iraq time. And that was so it would be in the morning in DC. And about 5.30 in the evening is when we started launching helicopters for the evening raids uh, in Iraq. So the entire organization was like going out of a football huddle. Just heard the play. Okay, got it, break. And for the next 22 and a half hours, you don't need to tell anybody what to do. They know what we're trying to do, so they decide what to do to support that. So you don't micromanage the what, you just keep giving them the why and the big mm -hmm. picture that usually doesn't trickle down. A lot of people at first said, well, people down lower, they don't want or need that information. Wrong on both counts. They want it, they need it, and they use it really well. So that was one of the things we changed. Next thing we changed is none of the organizations want to work together because I don't trust those people. They're so different from us. Mm -hmm. If you see SEAL Team 6 and Delta Force, one's Navy, one's Army, they're different. They are so much alike, it hurts. <laughs> I mean, and I used to tell them, you guys hate each other because you're so alike. You can't help it. So we started with these exchanges where I'd take a guy from one and put him in the other for four months at a time. And I got this big resistance to it. You know, no, no, you can't make us go to combat with people we don't know and trust. Yeah, I think I can. <laughs> and so we did. And then two or three months into it, one of the SEALs got hit and lost, or one of the Delta guys got hit and lost his leg just below the, uh, or just above the knee. And he was hit by friendly fire from a Navy SEAL who was attached to his team as mm. the exchange guy. So I thought, uh-oh, this is going to be proof that it doesn't work. Mm. But they'd gone long enough where the Delta guys trusted that guy, and they said, hey, it happens. Mm. And the guy who lost his leg actually ended up back in combat with a prosthetic leg a couple wow. of years later. But so th when you build trust through interaction, personal face-to-face -face interaction, it lasts. And then we did this liaison program because we had to bring all the embassies, all the, the major agencies in the United States, and whatnot. we had to get them all coordinated on a constant basis. So we sent liaisons to every one of these locations, usually in groups of three. So we'd have 24 hour coverage and they'd stay there four months. And you take them out of the field to do this. We right? took them out of yeah. cockpits of helicopters, out of fighter planes, off of shooting teams, intelligence people. And what we found was this turned out to be one of the most important jobs we had. Terrible as it sounds, going in the door and shooting was a commoditized skill. You could train a lot of people to do that. You couldn't train someone to go into the embassy in Damascus, get the ambassador to trust JSOC, get the different organizations to work together. Part of that was just whether they had that trait or not. So we started this program of pulling people we thought were mm -hmm. right from across the community, starting them at the least important liaison locations we had. And then the ones that turned out to be good, we'd stair step them because <laughs> we had a few, the embassy in Baghdad, embassy mm -hmm. in Damascus, CIA headquarters. We had to have people who those organizations just loved and trusted. And so we did that. But then you had to take care of the fact that you pull a Delta operator or a special ops pilot out of their skill and you make them wear a suit and do this. They think, ah, you ruined my career. I had to prove to them, no, I didn't. I am going to take care of you because what you're showing is you're not unidimensional. But that takes intention mm -hmm. because the big service can't do this. The big bureaucracy of the military just doesn't have the granularity to do that. So it became a, a role at my level mm -hmm. in command that, that really hadn't existed before, but it gave me a lot more ability to, to shape the force. So a lot of these things were you had to force the organization into doing things like we created cross-functional teams where you'd have a Delta Force leader, SEAL deputy commander, a Ranger sergeant major, different groups put together. And so they weren't what we call, you know, homogeneous of an organization. We put all the different aspects. You could say, well, it's a little inefficient doing that. For a little while it is, because initially as you're getting the pieces to fit, but then over time, the diversity of perspective, experience and whatnot actually makes them much better. And we also found that when we started the war, the average demographic of our force, as I described, was probably 35 male, white. You could almost geographically go across the country, guess who they were. Two years into the war, it was much more diverse by gender, by age, 
by race, by background, because what we found is the most important task was not, or qualification was not what you did in the last war. Wasn't how many medals you had, it's what you could contribute. And so particularly as became more intelligence focused, those kinds of skills grew and we used to say that your importance to the mission is not determined by your proximity to the target. We killed Abu Musab al-Zarqawi on a night in June 2006, and I gave one medal out. And it was to this slightly chubby intelligence sergeant who was 200 miles from the target because he was the guy who made it happen. For months, he, he kept us all focused. He said, don't get distracted. This is where we're going. This is going to be it. He pulled us all together and did it. When I gave it, the command loved it hmm. because I was respecting the fact that the people who really made a difference weren't just the people who sort of stereotypically get the medals from the president after an operation. Because think about it, a special operations raid that involves flying from A to B to get there doesn't end with the guy who gets off the helicopter. It may end there. But somebody's flying the helicopter, somebody's servicing the helicopter, somebody's refueling the helicopter, somebody's controlling the airspace, somebody built the helicopter, somebody's doing the intelligence, somebody's controlling the communication, somebody's providing the, f the food, the ammunition. Any one of those pieces that doesn't work and the mission fails. And arguably, one of the people on the ground can make a mistake and that's less dangerous than if somebody back earlier in the operation that provides a critical thing. So we really spent a lot of time, and this is where the, the technology to connect everybody supported us because right after the operation, we would connect every part of the organization that had been involved. I mean, minutes after an operation, we'd say, okay, we hit target X, here's what we found. And we'd talk back, because all the people who'd been part of it said, okay, what I did contributed straight yeah. to that. And that, I, I found that was really important because a lot of those people were back in the United States or they were in uh, Great Britain and so you're connecting this community that never sees itself personally, but yet is in, in, unquestionably linked for a really important thing. Yeah, and and it, you you also describe how as this matured, right? You you step back in terms of decision making, right? Yeah. Which I th I thought I thought it made because. Um, and you talk a little bit about you know getting woke up in the middle of the night to approve yeah. plans and realizing that you know it, it, it's you know even though you are the person running this whole show, you're probably not in the best position to decide whether yeah. this operation should go forward or not. Uh, David, that's so true. Yeah. Um, when I took command, the JSOC commander approved every operation because we didn't do a lot. We did very elegant, precise, strategic operations, but not often. But in Iraq, we'd gotten up to four a month or one a week. And so the JSOC commanders approving everyone, and that was doable. The problem was four operations a month wasn't gonna contribute to that fight. So it started to speed up, but we kept that where I would approve every operation so they'd do the plan and all this stuff. And they'd come to me for approval and all. I'd ask very sage questions, cause you know, I'm a sage guy. And <laughs> then one morning they wake me up and it, it was almost this way. We would work all night and I would go to bed right after dawn because the helicopters would be flying back in with prisoners we'd captured and the results of operations. So I'd go to bed at dawn, sleep for about four hours, but pretty often they'd knock on my door about an hour after I'd laid down. I lived in this little plywood hut right next to headquarters with my Sergeant Major. And it was one of two things. It, it, and I could tell as soon as they opened the door, I'd say, yep, and they'd open the door and if it was casualty, friendly casualties that they're coming to tell me about, I could look at the guy's face and I knew it. And unfortunately, in that kind of force, you just about know everybody. So if it's not that, they'd, then they'd be holding this sheaf of two or three, you know, PowerPoint slide maps usually. And I said, what do you got? They said, we want to drop a bomb on, you know, Abu Bag of Donuts. And I'd go, okay, knock yourself out. Stop. No, I would we'll go through this process. And so they come in and they'd show me the intel. And there's a legal finding we had. So we were very careful about this stuff. Don't ever think we were cavalier. So we'd go through the legal stuff. We'd go through all the intelligence. And I would go, okay, do you, do you think I should do this? And they kind of look at you and go, we woke you up, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, execute. And they'd go back out. I don't know, 30, 40% of the time, by the time they went back out, went to execute, the opportunity passed.
the guy moved, it's gone. And so I asked one morning, I said, why are you waking me up and doing this? And they go, because that's our process, we have to. You're, you're the decision maker. I said, well, this is stupid. What's my value add? What do I know? I know what you tell me in the moment, and then I have my sagacity that we mentioned earlier. But, you know, I've been asleep for an hour and I've been awake. How much is that? So stop it. Just make the decision. They go, you're responsible. I said, I'm always responsible. Just make the best decision. And it was amazing. At first, you think people would get really loose with drop. They didn't at all. They were very responsible, very good, but they were quicker when it mattered. They were more precise. It was interesting because if they brought it to me and I'd made a bad decision, they'd have gone, oh, boss had a bad day. But if they're making the decision, they own it in their minds. I mean, I own it legally, but in their minds, they own it. And I never once had anybody get outside of sort of the way I wanted them to think about it. And it made it so much faster and so much more focused on all kinds of things. And it taught me something about leadership. And, and that is, what decisions should the senior leader make? Mm -hmm. What are you really the right person to make? And now when we work with companies, I typically get with the CIO, go, what decisions do you make? And they go, well, I make budget. I approve the budget. Okay. Strategic hires. Okay. Major strategic things. Okay. And then they usually go, and everything else is important. Stop, stop. But, you know, mm -hmm. Let's erase that one. Because really at each of our levels, we should only make the decisions that are, should be made at our level. A tremendous number of them ought to be just devolved down. But we need to communicate that in the organization so people below us know what we both hope and expect they'll make for decisions. The biggest complaint I get from senior leaders in businesses now is, I wish my people would take more initiative and make more decisions. But you have to set yeah. that environment. Yeah. So in some of the time we have left, because I do want to save time for sure. questions, sure. um, I want to turn a little bit to some of the current events, right? Sure. So you... You speak, I mean, you crafted, um, you know, in both um, Iraq and Afghanistan, um, the tools, you know, that some of the best tools we have for, for dealing with counterinsurgency. Um, but we sit here today, but you also sort of warn about fighting the last war. And we yeah. sit here today and we have what feels like a fairly conventional war in Ukraine, kind of the reemergence of what you would think of as almost Cold War great power competition with China and maybe, you know, um, you know, issues around Taiwan, um, you know, issues vis-a-vis -vis Iran and their nuclear program, which, which also have this very maybe traditional flavor, um, is are we turning back to a moment of, you know, when, you know, when the, of traditional kind of warfare or how, how do you read this moment um, you know, in terms of, of where we've been and where we are now? On the strategic level, I yeah. think we are turning back. I think we're turning back to a, a multipolar great power world mm -hmm. that will see probably conflict between two or more great powers in the remainder of my lifetime and certainly in yours. And that's unfortunate. I wouldn't have said that 10 years ago. I think it's very likely. And of course, we're doing a proxy war right now. So we need to think that way. We need to think it is a tough world where people are willing to do things like land war in Europe that we, we sort of thought was unthinkable after 1989. So from that standpoint, yes. And we need to go to school on that. We need to understand that we're not in a postmodern environment. And so some of the things about diplomacy and uh, protecting resources and building up defenses, it's just a necessary reality. On the execution of warfare, that is where I think we could be mistaken if we're not careful. What we see in Ukraine looks a lot like World War II, which was much of the Eastern Front was fought in Ukraine. You see very slogging tank battles, muddy soldiers, artillery duels, and that looks 70 or 80 years out of date. It's really not quite like that. On the ground, it is an artillery warfare, but it's a precision artillery warfare. Now, you can hit any target you know where it is. And so knowing where a target is now because of the precision weapons is everything, which means that it slows, you can't mass forces, 
Uh, you can't because the enemy can do the same thing to you. And you can destroy very high-priced equipment pretty easily just with a cell phone linked back to a precision artillery weapon or something like high Mars is effective because it's so precise and it reaches out a good distance. So on the ground, it is more modern. The biggest change I think is if we watch the war in Ukraine, it's not being fought in Ukraine. I mean, there is a military component that the poor people on the ground are having to gut through, but it's being decided in the world. It's like an iceberg. On the top of it is the war you see, the artillery rounds being fired, the tanks. Below it is what we think. The best information war camp campaign I have ever seen has been waged during this war by Ukraine against us. Hmm. Now, we're willing targets, so I'm not holding it against Ukraine, but they've done a brilliant job of building support in the United States, particularly, but across the West for their cause. I mean, literally brilliant. And I, I say good on you because I happen to support it, but it's brilliant. The Russians have done a much more ham-handed job, but in some ways inside Russia and in other parts of the world, it's pretty effective too. And they are sending a different message to parts of the world. So what's happening is the ability to pass information, the ability to shape misinformation and disinformation, the outcome will be determined by what we think, whether we decide to be resolute, we the West, whether Ukraine believes they can win, whether Russia decides to be committed enough to grind this thing out because they could still win. Don't get me wrong. They could absolutely win. And so that's what we should be watching. Every incident and thing on the ground, its real importance is whether it is leveraged effectively back in the information mm -hmm. world. And as we're better and better at things like truly deep fake and things like that, it won't even have to happen. They'll just have to make you think it happened mm. for it to affect your... Now, that's going to apply in this war. And if you think about the war for the potential war for Taiwan, same thing now. This is a huge head game. The Chinese are trying to convince the Taiwanese giving, giving up is less dangerous than dying for your independence because that's a question mark. They're trying to get us to have a question mark. They're trying to get us to go, because we've had this 72 years, we've had a policy of ambiguity where we said, people say, are you gonna defend Taiwan if China tries to retake it? And we've said, we're not saying. What President Biden said about a year ago, yeah, we are. The reason I think he did that is because if the Chinese can get us to, to not be sure we're gonna do it, all they'd have to do is raise the perception on our side of what the cost would be. Yeah, you might be able to defend Taiwan, but you know, it's gonna cost you so many lives and so much money, it's really not gonna be worth it. And if they can make us have that debate in the moment of crisis, then they have a, a window to, to make it work. Hmm. And so again, this is in a time where we wanna have clear, diverse, open debate about political and policies and things like that, there's a certain advantage given to people who can focus information campaigns, create enough hesitation on the other side's part so that yeah. it won't happen. And so that's where I think the biggest change has come. And I think it's here before we fully appreciate it. Mm. Um, it's so, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I think about sort of the span of your career, right? And, you know, JSOC, which um, you led, as you said, was formed out of the failed Iran hostage rescue. A moment, as you said, it was the, the easiest year to get into uh, West Point, you know, in part because of this, um, this cloud that hung over the military post-Vietnam. Um, and, um, you know, you, you sort of lived that experience of the, of the new military and through Iraq and Afghanistan. And Biden has now pulled the troops out of Afghanistan in a way that, that you know, was, 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 I think, probably, you know, sad and, and, and messy to many who watched. And, and, and we're now passing the 20th year of the, um, 
the invasion of Iraq. You know, as you think about about this kind of this generation, what what are the kind of the key lessons that that we should take away from sure. kind of the last thirty years? Yeah, it's it's tough ones. I think the first one would would be let's not try to pretend that we won Iraq, Iraq or Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. We didn't. We did not accomplish what we'd hoped. They didn't go the way we we hoped they would. Mm-hmm. Now, I was in both for extended periods. And I never saw anybody over there trying to lose. I didn't see people who didn't care. I didn't see people who didn't have courage. I, didn't, I saw good people trying hard to do, to do what they thought was a good thing. Now, on the one hand, you go, well, wow. But what I'm saying is, if you put good people at it and you try your best, you resource it well, and it still doesn't come out, you better step back and say, what happened? Because you can't say we're just going to get smarter people next time because I don't think that's likely to happen. You got to step back and say, what were our problems? I think Afghanistan and Iraq were different. I, I thought going into Afghanistan was right. I thought going into Iraq was unnecessary. Saddam Hussein was a bad guy, but we didn't need to do that. Um, and I think we shouldn't have done that. But I think that the biggest weakness was when we went to execute, it was many of the real problems were getting the different pieces of the organization mm-hmm. to work together. That was really where we were weakest. When I finally commanded in Afghanistan, I was you know, four-star at that point. There were 46 nations in the coalition, and there was nobody in charge. The UN um, had the uh, high envoy there. There was a secretary general of NATO, but there's nobody was in charge. The U.S. was kind of in charge of every country. I was the military commander for all allied forces, but I was in charge of political thing and whatnot. So that was a fundamental weakness that we, we walked into and we recognized from earlier wars, but we didn't address mm-hmm. aggressively. We said, well, you know, we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, so we're, we're not going to get as effective. And it's like a business. Sometimes you've got to make hard decisions. Mm-hmm. Then the other thing I think is the United States does need to make as well, obviously, as much as possible, mature value-based policy decisions. Um, I don't think we do that wrong intentionally very often, but, but something like we should study how we got into Iraq. We should study it carefully because I was in the Pentagon during the last few months. I'd come back from Afghanistan. I was in the Pentagon and I, I got back from Afghanistan and I, I go on the joint staff and they're doing a war game to invade Iraq. And I was shocked. I said, what? Who's talking about invading Iraq? And they go, hey, we're doing a war game. And so there was this kind of inexorable move to that that the military didn't really offer much opinion on. We functionally did our job. We were told to plan this. Don't you worry about whether we do it. That's for the civilian leadership. But there should have been greater conversations about we really thought this through. We've done our homework. Mm-hmm. What's going to happen a year, two years after this? And I think that the harsh light of history is going to be pretty rough on the, the fact that we didn't do that as well as we should. Because the information was all there. It wasn't a question of not being able to know. There were so many cautionary flags. But it was a little like groupthink that, that came out of the uh, Bay of Pigs in 1961. They, this guy named Irving Janis studied the decision-making process, and he found the dynamics in a room can cause the group to suppress many of the dynamics that give you diversity, that give you oppositional thought, that give you different courses of action. And I think we witnessed that, and that's so easy to happen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very true. Well, look, I in I, w- I want to be sensitive about the time because so I want to open it up to questions um, for uh, Chairman McChrystal, um, sir. Uh, thank you very much for being here today. Oh, my honor. Um, building on what you just said about Iraq, um, I can only imagine how it would feel to be someone who served and to know that the person you looked up to who is prosecuting the war over there um, believed that it was, uh, you know, mistaken policy. So my question to you is when you, how do you sort of derive significance um, and, and I mean, pride even in work um, that is toward a task that you may not fully believe in? Yeah. 
It, it's a tricky one, I think, every organization, but particularly for the military. Because unless you've got a very black and white war, go back to the U.S. war with Mexico in the 1840s, it was even Ulysses Grant as a lieutenant at the time said, this is dead wrong. And many people felt that. And, and I think we've had ambivalence about many wars since then. I think you've got to do two things. I think the first is you've got to say, am I aligned on my nation? Can I be loyal to my nation? Do I believe? And if the answer to that is still yes, if you don't think that your nation has slid into something like Nazi Germany or something, then I think the soldier should have their say. We call it best military advice. But then once that's been decisions made, made, you do your job. And at that point, you take pride in doing your job based upon values and ethics, but doing what you're directed to do. Um, and it becomes gray because people say, well, if you didn't think that it was a good idea to do that, why didn't you resign? Well, if you have a military where everybody can resign, everybody that every time they disagree with the decision, you don't have an effective arm of government. And so what I believe is if those first things are true, if I still believe in my nation and I believe that the process wasn't corrupted, then I need to do what I signed up to do, which was the orders that I'm given. I remember when I was in Afghanistan as a four star, I asked for more forces. And some uh, report came out that said I was going to resign if I didn't get more forces, which was ridiculous. I said, I'm recommending that, but I got a boss. And when my boss decides and decides something different than I want, I don't get to just, you know, get in a huff and quit. I have to do my best with what he's decided to give me because and sometimes that boss has wider strategic perspective than I do. But it does come down to the values. You've, you've got to believe that you're still on the right side. And if you're not on the right side and you feel like you need to leave the service, I think you do that. Um, if you just feel that you're just dead wrong. Thank you. I think Steve had a question. No? That's behind. Hi, thanks very much. Uh, given uh, the situation that the Biden administration had when they inherited kind of or stepped into the Afghanistan situation, do you think you made the right decision? And what would you have changed? Yeah, that, that's a great one. I, I'm going to handicap my answer first. I'm emotionally wrapped in this one because I spent a lot of time in Afghanistan. I love the Afghan people. I cared about that mission. So, you know, discount what I say a little bit because I am biased. Um, I think he made the only decision he could in the big sense to pull out. Because if you think about it, President Biden had been against the war since back when he was vice president. And he'd been pretty public about that. OK, that's fair. That's his opinion. Then when President Trump made the deal with the Taliban and said in 18 months, we're going to pull every American out, that started a clock and the Taliban knew it. Did the Afghans knew it, the Taliban knew it. We were starting to withdraw air power. So it was becoming really clear what was lining up to everyone in Afghanistan. Um, President Biden takes over at the beginning of 2021 and he's got two choices. He's, he, they are signed up to all Americans out by one May of that year. And he can either continue with that or he can say, no, we're going to extend. If he extends, remember that the prevalent thought in America was we're in the forever war. It's never going to end. We got to get out. So he would have been politically swimming upstream and he would have been politically swimming upstream against what he believed and what he'd said. He did delay it. He said, OK, we're not going to do one May. We're going to do one September. Then the question is the execution of it. There are a couple places where I think it didn't work out like you know people hoped it would. The first is, do you go out slow, medium, or fast? And the guy who was commanding over there was a good friend of mine, used to work for me, and he, he gave three options. And slow, extend your vulnerability, because you've got Americans vulnerable at decreasing levels. Now, we're not worried about the Taliban attacking us during that period because the Taliban got no reason to attack us. We're leaving. Al Qaeda and ISIS do. They want to hit us on the way out. So that's the real threat. But you also want the government of Afghanistan to survive. Hope that it will. So they chose fast. And the idea was you take the air out of the balloon really quickly and Al Qaeda. Well, the reality is it just didn't work well enough to do that. And the state of Afghanistan collapsed and they the, the Taliban didn't conquer Afghanistan. They just took over. 
because the state just collapsed. Once the Afghan people lost the confidence that their government was strong enough and cohesive enough that they, it just, it went almost instantaneously. And the Taliban couldn't drive fast enough to, to get there and take over. I, I think that that could have been thought through better, but I don't have an elegant, better answer. So go, I, I don't want to tell you I do. The place where we didn't do well is we didn't take care of the Afghans who worked with us. And we were wrong because we had actually years to prepare to do that. And we've been talking about that for years. And I know that there was Afghan government saying, don't let those people come to the, don't let them depart the country to the United States because that will hasten the fall of Afghanistan. But we didn't think that went through well enough. And so I think we let down a lot of people. And unfortunately, the whole world watches. And the people who are watching is your other allies watch and they go, what happens if we're in trouble? Is the United States going to be there for us in all the right ways? And I think we, we took a black eye there and we should go to school on that one because America is an idea and it's an idea in which people have to have confidence, us first and foremost, but people around the world do. And if, if people don't believe that we will try to do the right thing, then we lose much of our leverage. Thanks for asking. Let me take one virtually submitted question and then I'll pass it over to Dorit. But um, we have a, we've received several from our virtual audience. So a um, how did you go about getting the leaders on board from different top organizations like the FBI and CIA, et cetera, in alignment and to work together? Yeah, it's a great question because at the beginning I had no idea. When we started this task force to get really serious starting in Iraq but wider, we needed help from all those agencies. So we needed people and resources and whatnot, but it wasn't in their interest to give them to us because you're taking things out of hide, you are uh, asking them to focus, and yet they think they're supporting us and we're gonna get all the credit. And because you don't wanna believe the government's that way, but it is about credit. It's about, you know, people are human. And so what we did was as we expanded the task force, we went to each of the organizations and we asked for more people and I asked for a senior person from each agency, a general officer equivalent, special executive servant. And I said, you can put them on my staff. They'll work right next to me every day, all day. They can communicate whatever they want. There's no limitation on what they can tell you about what we're doing. But if they think I'm screwed up, they can tell you that every day. And they sent, we had seven of them. Of course, we immediately called them the seven dwarves. Um, <laughs> and I'm still really close to all of the guys mm -hmm. who, and gals who were there. But what happened was they under, they got close and they understood what was happening. So they, and one of my requests was when you send somebody, send somebody with enough credibility to call the head of their agency, the secretary of state, mm -hmm. directors. And so what happened is they would call back and they say, hey, this is the real thing. These guys are doing it. They need more stuff. They need more of this. And so we started getting that. And then a little while later, we got belatedly the idea to create a board of directors so the task force became like a company with me acting as the CEO and we formed a board of directors and monthly we had a virtual call with a head of state department, CIA, national security agency and all. And I would report to the board of directors and I would say, this is what your task force is doing. And I'd make a great point out of saying, this isn't JSOC. I mean, we were about half of it actually. I was in command, but it's, I had a hundred and some CIA people, a hundred and some FBI all the time. And so what we do, and when an operation went, we went out of our way to, to point out the different contributions of all the organizations so that everybody felt that they were contributing to their task force. Late in the game, one of my staff officers got this bright idea. We're gonna do memoranda of agreement and get this codified. We're gonna do contracts. I said, you're gonna do nothing of the sort. Because if I'd done that, those organizations would have felt boxed in and they would, they would have negotiated way less. As long as they felt they could pull it out anytime they wanted, they gave a lot more. Hmm. And I learned it's trust. Yeah. It's trust and relationships that, that does that. Hmm. One more. Hi, thank you. Um, so it sounds like much of the leadership and strategic learning and acumen that you kind of gleaned from your experience in the military has really translated 
beautifully into your business career now. Um, and so my question for you is about managing stress. Um, you know, we live in a very complicated world. Organizations are getting more and more complicated. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about, you know, how you counsel executives now to manage the kind of stress that you were accustomed to in the military. Yeah. That, that's a great question. I'm going to focus it most at the high level, but people feel stress at every part of the organization. And I'll tell you up front, I think a little stress is good. I think if you don't feel a little stress, you're not interested. And, you know, it's like in combat, you get on the ground, the first bullet fires, you're paying attention. <laughs> you know, everybody's head to the game. So I think the first thing that I have found works is try to keep things in perspective. Every crisis seems like a huge crisis until a bigger crisis comes. So develop a way to when something comes first, sort of scope out. How big a threat is this? What's the real risk here? What's the opportunity here? And when you get that kind of perspective, people can step back a little bit because not everything can be an existential crisis. The second thing is I'm a great believer in having a bit of discipline in your process. We call it an operating rhythm, and in combat, you call it a battle rhythm. And it's a cadence of meetings. And people say, well, why do we need meetings unless we need meetings? You need meetings just to stay connected. You need meetings to keep the information flow and the, the sense of, I'm going to see my boss every other day at this time, and I know that, and it, it'll work. That's a certain amount of normalcy. Even in the height of the biggest crises, we used our battle rhythm as a very disciplining uh, factor for us. Uh, you also need personally senior leaders need to have their own way of doing that because you can throw yourself into um, just sort of a tizzy, particularly early in leadership because you get your first crisis and you want to stay awake for 72 straight hours because you're important and et cetera. You got to let the organization function. And so you, when I say let, you've also got to force it to function. And so the more experienced commanders learn to identify when they need to give guidance, when they need to be updated, and when they need to keep their hands off and keep their nose out of it. So you go in, you focus, you ask questions, you do, and then you step away and you let the organization function. Then you know how much information you have to have. Once you're holding your hand on the stick all the time, one, you're not gonna be as good, and two, the organization well, and, and you'll start to stress out yourself. And then sort of the final thing is, <clears throat> I found I needed a very disciplined personal rhythm. And my personal rhythm, as I described, I, I slept four hours a night during that war, which was, it's too little, but that was just kind of what worked. And so every day I'd go to bed right about dawn. And typically what we do is, uh, we fight till dawn, then I'd go to bed for that four hours. I'd get up and then I'd go work out every day. I don't care what's happening. I'd work out. I ran most days, but sometimes in this gym we had there. And that sort of centered my body back. I'd come back out of there. I'd send my wife an email, you know, very controlled thing. I'd read the email. She said, I'd send an email and then we'd start a series of, of meetings, whatnot. I ate at the same time every day. I interacted certain things. And I'd, I'd go out on battlefield things on different days. But I felt, I found for me, protecting that rhythm was really important. If I didn't work out every day, if I didn't do certain things, the amount of time I got to contribute to the fight was a pretty small increment of value compared to the better me that showed up if I stayed on an even keel. I think that's great advice. So um, we're, we're very out of time, but you know, after, because it's just so important to me and I know to you, um, you know, after a lifetime of, of service, can you just share a few thoughts on national yeah. service? Because this really is yeah. uh, something that, you know, I, uh, you know, I think I and we as an organization feel very yeah. strongly about. David, thanks for asking. Yeah. Um, and I know you've got a passion for it. To me, service is just service to the world but more specifically, I tend to think of it as to other Americans. But we're citizens. Most of us became citizens because we were born here. We didn't do anything to earn it. We just got it. And with that, we got all these rights, which are good rights. And we get a lot of privileges and we get things for which most of us pay taxes and we vote. Well, not most of us, 
Only about half of us vote. And so if you think about it, what's a citizen? A citizen is simply someone who signed on to a contract that said the United States is a thing and we're going to make this work, which means that thing helps me as an individual, but it means I got to help everybody else. I have responsibilities. And I think that, how do you learn that? If you go back to old towns where you had a militia that, that kept away threats or volunteer fire departments or things where everybody had to come together to raise one farmer's barn because you couldn't do it otherwise. And so you had this necessary sense of community because that's the only way it worked. Now we've gotten to the point where we've taken a step away and we say, if I pay taxes, they're gonna hire somebody to do it. So we, we have less direct feeling about what's my responsibility to everybody else. What's my responsibility to the government? for how the government runs, for example, at the local, state, or, or national level. And it becomes almost ethereal. It needs to be more personal in my view. But how do you learn that? And I think that you learn it through experience. If you really wanna learn something, go do something for a while. And I think that if you wanna learn how the world and how the United States works, go out and do what the United States does. So if every young American spent at least one year of full-time national service, they can be in healthcare, they can be in education, they can be policing, they can be in anything. If they spend a year doing that, they're going to come away a different person. What we found is if you go do city year, AmeriCorps, any of those, you vote at three times the rate of your peers because you've gotten close. You say, hey, this stuff matters. You also have this sense of part ownership. If you've ever had to pick up trash somewhere, you suddenly resent people who litter there. And so I think that what we owe young Americans is that opportunity. And you say, well, they can go do it if they want. They can go volunteer for a year. Well, it's really hard to do that. One, if you've got a family that can support you for a year while you do something like that, all right, it's fine. But not many of us did at that age. And also, we're not set up for that. If we were set up so that colleges wouldn't take you unless you did a year of service or businesses wouldn't hire you or all these kinds of things, suddenly everybody would be connected. I spent a lot of time in Israel during the war because we were closely coordinated with them. And Israelis will argue about everything. But when you get them together, except for, you know, a small group, they always start the conversation. Hey, what brigade were you in? Or what'd you do mm -hmm. in the service? And it just sort of starts the conversation. Yeah. And what if we started our conversation? Where'd you do your service? Well, I was in an elementary school in New Orleans. I was in this. And you just kind of start and then you go, okay, now what are you doing now? And you go, I think it would heal a lot of the divides we've got, the economic divides, the racial divides, the political divides, just because in many cases, we don't know each other. We know about each other through these lenses, which are pretty distorted right now. And if America's going to solve what I consider its biggest existential threat, which is us, we've got to get upstream of the problem. We've got to get upstream of what is causing us to be this way and fix it. And we're not going to fix it with my generation. I'm not embarrassed about my generation, or anything, but it's, it's done. It's got to be the people in this room and your kids and we got to create that opportunity. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.